Feel the power. Welcome to Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the ever increasing word feast. Always my joy and my pleasure to serve you the grace of God right here on this consistent broadcast that we have held on for many years now. Abel Damina is my name. The intent of these teachings brought your way every time, every time, many times a day, is to equip you because the essence of ministry is to equip the saints to do the work of ministry that the body of Christ may be edified. And it's always an honor for me to serve you the grace of God. Today is going to be explosive as together we fellowship in the word of his grace. But just before we get into the service, I want to call your attention to a new book I just wrote. The book is titled, Every Man a Minister, Responding to the Call of God. Ministry is the highest form of calling. It is the honor Jesus bestows upon every believer along with salvation. The call to ministry is not a different encounter or experience. It is the same as the call to salvation. Many believers today are found with the excuse of not being called to ministry. They claim they have not seen a vision or had any experiences. They are. Every believer is called. In this book, get ready to unlearn and relearn as I examine dutifully the will of God, salvation through the ages. How the believer is to fulfill the plan and purpose of God on earth. Salvation as a call to the ministry. Consecration in ministry the cost of the cause, the role of the local church, ministry gifts, and the evolution of ministry gifts in the book of Acts. You will also discover that the local church is a place for discipleship and training for ministry. That is, upon salvation, men are taught the scriptures and trained to serve, which is ministry. This book is a must-have. That is to say, you don't have to wait to hear a voice to see a light or to see an angel, or to hear some thundering. No, the day you got born again was the day you were called into ministry. This book will equip you with all you need to answer to that call, to fulfill that call. So when you see Jesus, when the sun is no more, the moon is no more, the rains are no more falling, and this planet is gone, when mortality puts on immortality, and you see Jesus, you will not be ashamed at his coming. You need to call the office quickly and place an order for this book. And of course, it's appearing on the screen right now. The number to call and the email address to send a mail to ordering for this book, for yourself and for other people you want to put into their lives. This book will change your life. Let me also mention that if you watch my teachings and you've been following my teaching and where you live, there is no... Christocentric church where you will go and hear the message of Christ. You've looked around, no church there is able to serve you the message of Christ like we do. We would like to help you either start a campus or identify with a campus that we have in your area. We will train you, equip you, and work with you until the campus is started in your community so that there will be a lighthouse in your community for other people to come to the knowledge of Christ. All you need to do today is shoot a mail to the email address on the screen right now or call the number and let me know that you want to start a campus or you want to join any of our campus. A campus is an extension of our church, it, like what you call branches. We don't call them branches in Power City. We call them campuses all over the world. You want to be a part of this team? Shoot a mail today. The email address is on the screen. I want to take you right now into the service, into the teaching of God's word. Make sure you have your pen, your notebook, and your Bible. It's going to be exciting as we adventure through the riches of redemption. Enjoy the service and be blessed. Amen. We're looking at New Testament ministry, New Testament ministry. And it is important to understand that as we proceed, that the Bible is communicated in words. The Bible is communicated in words which means God's word is communicated to us in words which also means that the entire revelation of God is communicated to men in words.
God. The Bible is the only book on earth that contains within it the revelation of God. The only book, the only document that contains the revelation of God. So, the Bible is communicated in words. The revelation of all that is written is also available to the one that is willing to receive what is written. The revelation is available to the one who is willing to receive what is written with the simplicity of his or her heart. It requires a sincere approach to learning to be able to rightly interpret that which is written. You need a sincere approach to learning. Very sincere. Because if you are not sincerely seeking to learn, you will never arrive at the knowledge of the truth. There's a class of people the Bible tells us they are always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So you can be learning falsehood. You can be learning deception. You can learn the wrong things and spend your life learning it. And even become a custodian of what is not right. Ever learning, never able to come. So that's why sincerity of approach to learning is critical, especially to that which is written. So a precise and accurate Bible interpretation is very crucial. Very crucial. Precise, accurate Bible interpretation is very crucial in having a wholesome appraisal. Of biblical concepts. In having a wholesome appraisal of biblical concepts or themes. Of course, you know that doctrinal persuasions are only made available within the confines of sound doctrine. 2 Timothy 3.15 Brother Paul says to Timothy and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So the scriptures are the sole custodian of wisdom where salvation is concerned and salvation of the scriptures is faith in Christ. Salvation of the scriptures, the holy scriptures, communicates to us faith in Christ. Diligence, therefore, will entail paying attention to every and any detail. Paying attention to every and any detail, taking into consideration the fact that the Bible was written in human language. And can be understood and interpreted in human language. The Bible is not written in heavenly language. The Bible is written in human language. Therefore, it has to be interpreted in human language and communicated in human language. However, this will require taking into cognizance the central theme of the Bible. Which the Spirit of God unveils to us that the central theme of the Bible is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus had a conference or a Bible study with his disciples. And this gives us a lead into how the Bible is interpreted. Had a very detailed conference after his resurrection. In Luke chapter 24, and while these guys were walking on their way to Emmaus, Jesus walked among them and said to them, what are you guys discussing? You look so serious. And they said to Jesus, are you a stranger in town? Have you not heard about the guy called Jesus who was killed the other day? And Jesus said to them, what, what, what events are you guys talking about? Oh yeah, they went ahead and rebuked him. They were preaching Jesus to Jesus, but they didn't know Jesus. So a man can be preaching Jesus, but never knows Jesus. They were very serious, preaching Jesus to Jesus, but they didn't know who Jesus was. So Jesus turned to them and he called them fools. Oh fools, Luke 24, 25. Oh fools, 
and slow of heart to believe. Slow of heart to believe. All that the prophets have spoken. You are slow of heart to believe. So the problem was they didn't believe. They were able to narrate the events. They were able to communicate the events but didn't believe. Yeah. They told Jesus all that happened but didn't believe. They were slow. Brados cardia. They were sluggish in their understanding. Slow in their hearts to believe all that the prophets have spoken. The Old Testament prophets. And then he now gave them a summary of the entire Old Testament. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And next verse, beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. If your Bible was mine, I will circle the things concerning himself because he has zeroed the entire context of the scriptures to himself. The things concerning himself. They were slow of heart to understand that the scriptures were written concerning him. They were sluggish in their understanding. Hence, we say the Bible is a Christocentric material that carries with it a Christocentric message, a Christ-centered message. The book is the book of Jesus. The message is the message of Jesus. The attention is focused on Jesus. Hence, Christology forms our theology. Christology forms our theology. Our theology is predicated on Christology. Our theology is predicated on Christology. Hence, if you do not have an understanding of Christology, you don't have a theology. If you do not have an understanding of Christology, you do not have any theology. Because the theology of God is manifested in Christology. The theology, our study of God is via Christ. 1 John chapter 5 verse 20. And we know that the son of God is come and had given us an understanding. The coming of the son of God is to give us an understanding that we may know him that is true. Even in his son Jesus Christ. This is the true God. So Jesus is the true God. We cannot know God outside Christ. Christ reveals God to us. Christ unveils God to us. Our knowledge of God is in Christ. That we may know him that is true. Even in his son Jesus Christ. This is eternal life. So Jesus is the true God and eternal life. Without Christ, no eternal life. Without Christ, no God. John chapter 17 verse 3. This is life eternal that they may know you the only through God and that and is TKS Kai, the Kai rule of Bible interpretation. The only true God, that is Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. The true God is Jesus Christ. In verse 27, he expounded unto them that what Luke 24, 27. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He expounded. The word expounded is the Greek word diharmonia. He, he diharmonia. Now, we spell diharmonia. Diharmonia as D-I-E-R-M-E-N-E-U-O. Diharmonia. It's a compound word gotten from two words. D-I-A, die, implies thoroughly across to the other side. Thoroughly across. That is, in Bible interpretation, we do not cross over, we cut through. You don't cross over. Crossing scripture, when you carry a scripture, and you jump it here, okay, that's, that's crossing over. 
We don't cross. We cut through. Cutting through scriptures is what brother Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study spudazo. Study spudazo. Means be eager, be zealous to show yourself approved of God a workman that needs not to be ashamed rightly dividing autotomio the Greek word. It means to cut straight. To cut straight. That is, in interpreting the scriptures, we cut the scriptures straight. We cut through a path. We navigate straight. We do not cross over. Crossing over is a mode of communication for those that are that their IQ of understanding is very low. When people are low in their understanding, they cannot cut through. So you cross them over and that is what we call parables. Parables is crossing over, not cutting through. Are you following? That's why Jesus said, I have yet many things to say to you, but I cannot say it now because you can't bear it. Okay, so that means I couldn't cut through the scriptures with you. So what I did was I crossed over because you couldn't travel along with me in cutting through because you lack the capacity to understand. Expounded diharmonia. Okay, diharmonia. Then the word harmonia implies to interpret, to explain or to translate or to give a meaning. To interpret, to explain, to translate, or to give a meaning. The word expounded. It means to interpret or to explain something or to give it meaning. Meaning that when Moses, please listen carefully, I beg of you. When Moses communicated in the Old Testament, he never communicated in literal terms. That's why Jesus interpreted Moses. If he had spoken in literal term, you wouldn't need interpretation. The reason for interpretation is the mode of communication. If I walked into the service and I said, ladies and gentlemen, praise the Lord. What will you say? Because you understood what I said. But if I came into the service and I said, ladies and gentlemen, 366, 366. You're looking at me. You don't know what I'm talking about. But you know three. You know six. You know six. You know three, you know six, you know six, but you don't know 366, 366. Why? I'm communicated in a coded language. Hence, you will need an interpreter for what I am saying. Moses didn't speak in literal terms. Hence, the need for interpretation. Why? Because Moses was not born again. Moses was an unbeliever by today's standard for lack of a better description. What I'm simply saying is he was not born again. So since he was not born again, he couldn't communicate in spirituals. Comparing spiritual with spiritual. Okay? Moses wasn't born again. The natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit, neither can he know them. Somebody says, why are you talking like that about Moses? Oh, sure. I'm not the only one who talked like that about them. First Peter chapter 1 verse 10. Of which salvation, the prophets. The prophets mean all the Old Testament prophets. Have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. So they prophesied of the grace that was coming. Moses inclusive. Okay, next verse. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand. That's why it's a prophecy. The sufferings of Christ and the glory that shall follow. Next verse. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves. That's why they were searching. They spoke things they didn't understand. And after they spoke, they started searching to know what they have said. And then it was revealed to them that what you are saying, you are not the beneficiary. 
those that those words are meant for are still coming. And today they are here. Glory to God. That's why brother Paul will, will put it like this for them in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9. As it is written, I had not seen nor ear heard, neither have they entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. Next verse. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. So what Moses and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Elijah, Nehemiah, Habakkuk, Zechariah, Zapaniah, Obadiah, Amos, Joel, what they could not see and they could not explain, even though they prophesied, we have the revelation. So if they come here now, we will sit them down and teach them from what they said and they will write new notes. But God has revealed them to us. How? By the Spirit. We are the revelation generation. God has revealed them to us by the Spirit. For the Spirit such it all things. Yea, the deep things of God. Now. So that's why Jesus had to expound or interpret. It therefore implies to explain thoroughly, to interpret or to give meaning or to explain across. To explain the scriptures across. Jesus therefore explained the scriptures across. It is a word used historically to interpret signs and symbols. Diharmonia. Historically, you diharmonia only when you are explaining signs and symbols. It's used to explain signs and symbols. A mode of communication. Diharmonia is used to explain types and shadows. You cannot employ the use of diharmonia except there has been a communication in types, shadows, signs, and symbols. So when there is a communication in types, shadows, signs, and symbols, you employ the use of diharmonia to bring people to understanding. Are we clear? Yeah, diharmonia. He interpreted. He interpreted Moses. He interpreted the prophets. He interpreted the Psalms. Look at that. Luke chapter 24 verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. Come on, Nagaya. That all things must be fulfilled. Which were written where? In the law of Moses and where? In the prophets and where? In the Psalms concerning me. Next verse. Then... Open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Understand twice. Alright? Double mention. Which means you need to pay attention. Why did they arrive at understanding here? Please pay attention. We'll get there in a few minutes. This shows that Bible interpretation is not personal but general. Therefore, Jesus did an interpretation of all the scriptures. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. All the scriptures. All the scriptures. So the center point of Jesus' explanation was himself. The word diharmonia, let's see the application of that word. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 30. Have all the gifts of healing. Do all speak with tongues. Do all diharmonia. Do all interpret. Interpret. First Corinthians 14 verse 5. I would that you all speak with tongues. But rather that you prophesy. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues. Except he interpret diharmonia. That the church may receive edifying. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 13. 
Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Diharmonia. That he may interpret. First Corinthians 14, 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three and that by cause and let one interpret the word diharmonia where it was applied. Meaning that when Jesus expounded to them, what he did was he interpreted Moses, he interpreted the law, he interpreted the prophets, he interpreted the Psalms, which means... That the law, the prophet, and the Psalms were communicated in signs and symbols. And that's why you cannot take them hook, line, and sinker and apply. Because the interpretation of what was communicated is not at face value. It requires somebody to decipher what they were trying to say. Are we clear? So Jesus interpreted all of these people in the Old Testament. Concerning me. Expounded in all the scriptures the things concerning him. The word concerning, concerning was it translated from the Greek word peri, P-E-R-I, peri. Peri is an operative word. It implies an arrival point. An arrival point. That means when he took Moses and took the prophets, he brought all of them to their point of arrival. What was their point of arrival? Himself. That all Moses was trying to say was Christ. All the prophets were trying to say was Christ. So Christ is the destination of the prophets. Christ is the destination of the law. Christ is the destination of the Old Testament. All of the Old Testament was a journey to arrive at Christ. Peri, concerning himself, arrival point. Arrival point. Glory to God. Arrival point. So all the speaking of the prophets have a destination. Himself. So all the prophets spoke. And their arrival point was Christ. Glory to God. John 1.45. See what Philip told Nathaniel in John chapter 1 verse 45. Philip findeth Nathaniel and saith unto him. We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. The son of Joseph. He's the one everybody wrote about. He's the one everybody was talking about. So ladies and gentlemen, ministry is not ministry. Until it is focused on the message of Christ. Once you are in ministry and your focus, your mainstay is not Christ. You are in something else that does not have a Bible definition. We didn't say you are not doing something. You are doing something but it does not have a doctrinal definition. Yes, people can be falling. Yes, people can answer altar call. Yes, you can have a crowd. Yes, they can give plenty offering. Yes, you can have a building with cars and buses. But it does not have a doctrinal accommodation. Once it is not concerning him, and I'm not talking about using the name of Jesus to open prayer and close prayer. No, that is a label you are advertising with. We are talking of content. That the content in the container must be Christ. Even if he doesn't have a label. 
What matters is not the label. It's the content. The mainstay. The church is called the ground and the pillar of truth. That means it is the headquarter. Where the concentration is truth. Who is truth? I am the way, the truth, and the life. So, the content of ministry that makes ministry, ministry must be Christ from beginning to finish. If it is not Christ, it has no Bible definition. What you are doing may have a secular definition, but it certainly doesn't have a Bible definition. And this is not to make you feel bad. But it is to put the truth in your face. So if you need to make adjustments, you can start quickly. We read 2 Timothy 3.15 and it tells us that salvation is faith in Christ. Faith in Christ. So the Old Testament can only be explained in the light of Christ. The Old Testament can only be explained in the light of Christ because Moses and the prophets and the Psalms spoke of him. So if we're going to explain Moses and explain the prophets, it will be in the light of Christ. Once you explain the Old Testament outside Christ, you will end up in idol worship. Yeah. Because Jesus is the peri, the arrival point of all the prophets. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> so faith in Christ, therefore, is synonymous with faith in his work. Faith in Christ means. Faith in his sacrificial work. Huh. It's not just, how many of you believe in Jesus? Wow. How many of you believe in Jesus? Ah. If you believe in Jesus, clap. Bah, 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 bah. Even the devil believes and trembles. You, you only believe. Satan adds trembling to his own. So Satan even believes more than you. Bible says Satan believes Jesus and trembles. So, salvation is not believing in Jesus. Because Satan believes in Jesus. And he trembles with his own. Are we teaching here? That's why I took it a bit further. Faith in Christ is synonymous with faith in his sacrificial work. So it's not just faith in Christ. You believe in Jesus? Yes, I do. If you believe in Jesus, clap your hand. No, no, no. It is, it is synonymous with his sacrificial work. So faith in Christ is actually faith in his sacrificial work. Listen carefully. Faith in Christ or faith in his sacrificial work is different from faith for healing. Because even unbelievers that don't believe in Jesus can believe for healing and be healed. It's different from faith for things. Faith in Christ is absolutely faith in his sacrificial work. Death, burial, resurrection. That woman with the issue of blood who touched the hem of Jesus' garment wasn't saved. Because she had faith for healing. See, I know if I can touch the game of his garment, I know I will be healed. And she touched him and she was okay. That's not salvation. Most of the people Jesus healed were not believers. All. All the people Jesus healed in the gospels, none of them was a believer. In fact, one of them emphatically told him, I don't believe, but just help my own belief. And Jesus healed him. So all those teachings on 10 keys to healing is fraud. There is no key to healing. Healing is God's character. You don't need a key for God's character. Healing is God's nature. Anywhere God is revealed, healing happens because that is his character. Healing is God's nature. It's 
God's nature. Huh? The man at the pool. <laughs> he said, I've been sitting here for 38 years. I have no man. I'm waiting for the pool, the moving of the water so that I can jump in. But every time I'm about to jump in, people that are better than me jump in. I have been sitting here seeking to enter the pool for 38 years. And Jesus said to him, will that be made whole? So that means that pool didn't heal anybody. That pool was a myth. Muthos. There was nothing in the pool. Nothing. Nothing was inside the pool. That pool was an empty pool. If anybody got healed inside, it was just an accident. It's not because there was something inside. Because nothing could have been in the pool when Jesus was around. Jesus was already on earth moving. So nothing will be in that pool. The real attention is on Jesus. That's why Jesus came to the pool and said, Gentlemen, what are you doing here? Because there's nothing here. The real thing is here. Will that be made whole? I have no man. Ah, man? You don't need a man. The, man. the man is here. He said, when they push, he said, you are talking about water. He said, yes, nobody to push me inside. He said, Do you want to go home? The man is still talking. He said, stand up, carry your mat and get out. The man carried his mat and walked away. And Jesus left the pool because there was nothing in the pool. And went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. So that pool was a Jewish muthos. It was a myth. Like a superstition. The real healer is Jesus. And he was already on earth. So he can't be on earth and another pool is healing for him. No, he's the healer. There are many myths in the Bible that has to be explained. And don't forget the book of John where the pool was recorded. is not a doctrinal book. It's an eyewitness account. That is what John saw people do and he recorded it. It's not doctrine. That's why no apostle had a pool. No apostle built a pool. In case you are thinking of building one, you will just deceive yourself. No apostle in the Bible built a pool. Paul didn't build a pool. Peter didn't build a pool. James, John, none of them built a pool because there's nothing about a pool. We heal in his name. Peter and John met the man at the gate beautiful. Silver and gold have we known, but such as we have, we give unto you. In the name, hallelujah, God of God. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. The man stood up and got out of that place. And they were looking at them like some superheroes. And Peter said, why look ye on us as though by our power or by our holiness has made this man to walk? This man's faith in the name. Has made him strong in the presence of you all. The faith is that is by him. The man believed in the name. So faith for healing is different from faith in Christ or his works for salvation. Faith in Christ is faith in what Jesus has done in his resurrection, precisely. So when you have faith in Christ, the result of faith in Christ is you become a son of God. John 1, 12, as many as receive him, to them gave the power to become the sons of God. Hallelujah. The word diharmonia is very key to me because we are trying to get you to understand how the New Testament ministry functions. The Bible is divided into two compartments by the translators. You have the Old Testament, you have the New Testament. Old Testament, Genesis to Malachi. New Testament, Matthew to Revelation. That's the way it is technically divided. But theologically and properly explained, the Bible is not just Old Testament, Genesis to Malachi, New Testament, Matthew to Revelation. That's not the way it's divided. Because the New Testament did not start in Matthew. You see, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are still Old Testament books. The New Testament started in Acts of the Apostles. Are we clear? Yeah. Because the New Testament is built on the works of Christ. What Christ has done. His resurrection. 
Jesus said, this is the New Testament in my blood. So until the blood of Jesus was shed, there was no New Testament. So the New Testament started with the resurrection of Christ. And Acts chapter 1 says, after his resurrection. So that's where the New Testament started. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus was under the law. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, 5, and 6. He was made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we may receive the adoption of sons. That's why in Matthew 5, 17, he said, I'm not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. So he was fulfilling the law. And that's why on the cross, the first thing he said is, it is finished. What was finished was not seen. Because it is not the cross that took away sin. What took away sin was the death, the barrier, and the resurrection. So when he stood on that cross and said, it is finished, he wasn't talking about your sin. He was talking about the law that he came to fulfill. What he meant is, I have fulfilled the law, and now the law is retired without retirement benefits. The law is no more functional. It's over with the law. For what the law could not do. In that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his son. In the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law. May be fulfilled in us. Not by us. In us who walk not after the flesh. But after the spirit. So Jesus fulfilled the law in us. So once you receive Christ, you have fulfilled the law. The law cannot condemn you. So there is therefore no condemnation to those who are where? In Christ. So once you are in Christ, the law has no power over you anymore. So that's why sin shall not have dominion over you because you are not under the law, but under the grace of God. So under the grace, you are a champion over sin and the law and death. Is it clear? So the Old Testament, therefore, please listen carefully, is not books. And the New Testament is not books. The Old Testament is a relationship with God that is predicated on what human performance is able to provide. Morality. What I am able to do. Trying to please God. Trying to qualify. I fast twice a week. I pay my tithes all the time. I pray two times a day. In the morning and at midnight when demons are changing officers. When there's a change of God. You know some churches, that's what they teach. I don't know where they got that from. Maybe from the extra books of the Bible. <laughs> and the Bible says Jesus loving him. Looked at the young rich ruler, a Pharisee, who has qualified himself by the law. He said, Jesus said to him, you know the Ten Commandments. And he was angry. He said, ah, Jesus, how dare you ask me to keep the Ten Commandments when that is what I have kept since I was a little boy. Before the law, I am blameless. I have kept the law. I'm a moralist. I'm a good guy. That I come to you doesn't mean I'm a sinner. It's just that I have discovered that you're a good man and you have what I don't have. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, okay, since you have kept the Ten Commandments, go and sell all you have. He kept all the Ten Commandments, but he didn't take care of greed. And under the law, if you break one, you break all. So he had taken care of visible sins, but didn't take care of invisible sins. Because greed is invisible. So Jesus sized him up and saw that, okay, this guy is good in everything physical. Let's go into the sins of the heart. Because some of you don't fornicate, but you are as malicious as the devil himself. You keep malice more than malice. You don't steal, but you are jealous. You don't do anything physical, but you're full of envy. You're full of strife. Competition is your second name. You break one, you break all. That's why by the law shall no man 
be justified. So if you are a keeper of the law, get ready to suffer because you will never qualify. That's why brother Peter looked at those guys and said, why put on these new Christians a yoke that neither we nor our fathers could carry? What Peter publicly admitted is that we, under the law, we are hypocrites. We are not even qualified. Teaching good? So that's why in Christ, the law of Moses loses power over the believer. The, the believer is free from the law. Totally free. The law of the spirit of life where in Christ Jesus has set me free from what? The law of sin and death. What is the law of sin and death? The law of Moses. So the New Testament started from the resurrection. The Old Testament is Genesis to Malachi. But of course, if you have followed our teachings and for the purpose of those that I knew... The, new, the Old Testament is not from Genesis. The Old Testament started from Exodus. Look at Hebrews chapter 8 verse number 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. Which was established upon better promises. Look at the next verse. For if that first. First covenant. First had been faultless, had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. If that first covenant was perfect as regarding man's relationship with God, there will be no need for a second. Now listen carefully. When it was written first, it was not actually first, it was the covenant. Because you can't say first until there is second. But if there is no second in view, what you will have is the covenant. What was available was the covenant. It was when the covenant failed, initiating a second made the covenant first covenant. I don't know if I'm complicating at all. It was when the first which was the only covenant failed, initiating the second covenant rendered the, the covenant the first. So look at it. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Next verse. For finding fault with them, not with it. Finding fault with them, not with it. He saith, behold, the day is come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, please pay attention. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. When? In the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. What was the first covenant like? Because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. So the old covenant, which was the first covenant, was a conditional covenant. You don't regard me, I don't bless you. You don't do, I don't do. You do, I do. Now, he said the first covenant had a fault. Then he said the fault is that it found fault with them. It was a fault finding covenant. That is under that covenant, no matter how good you are, it will find fault with you. Under that covenant, you can never be perfect. Oh, you can never be perfect under that covenant. For it found fault with the people. That is why Hebrews chapter 10 verse number 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come. And not the very image of the things. Can never. If your Bible is your own. You didn't borrow it from your neighbor. Use your pen and underline can never. Can never means can never. 
No matter how many animals you kill and bring to the altar, you remain a sinner. No matter how much you confess your sins, you are still a sinner. Why? It can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the commas there unto perfect. It can never. Look at the next verse. For then will they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But look at the next verse. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Look at me. So every year they are bringing the animal, they remember their sins. So the animal sacrifices generated sin consciousness. That is what confessing your sin does to you. Every time you confess your sin, it gives you sin consciousness. And sin consciousness takes away your boldness. And when you have no boldness, you cannot approach the Father. What bringing animals to the altar every year was to them is what confessing sin today is to anybody who confesses sin every time he prays. If bringing animals will have taken away their sin, they wouldn't have stopped. So the same thing, confessing sin cannot take away sin. The cure to sin is not confessing sin. The cure to sin is Christ who took away the sin of the world. So the cure to sin is confessing Christ. That's the cure. Behold the Lamb of God. He took it away. So if I want to be free from sin, what do I do? I confess the taker away of the sins. So God's cure for sin is Christ. God's cure for sin is Christ. God's cure for sin is not confessing sin. Confessing sin is a ritual under the law. Every year they were bringing it. Now, get back to that Hebrews chapter 8 and look at this. Now, remember that the first covenant found fault with them. Look at me, everybody. Please give me your attention. How many of you have realized in the study of the scriptures that the only place you will find the mistakes of the heroes of the Old Testament is in the Old Testament? Have you observed that? Who was Abraham? Using the Old Testament eyes to look at Abraham. Who was Abraham? A liar? Huh? Idol worshiper? Huh? An adulterer or womanizer? Polygamist? How did you know that? Old Testament. Who was David? Uh, uh, why did you do ah? Uh, Okay, I will see how you will talk about the next one I want to call. But let's say to how was David? Eh? Murderer? Womanizer? Wife snatcher? Eh? Yahoo, Yahoo. <laughs> Yahoo man. <laughs> eh? Murderer? David was a... How did you know that? What about Solomon? <laughs> eh? He was a capo. <laughs> okay, let's leave Solomon. What about Samson? Eh, what about Samson? Eh, strong man only. He was stronger than strong man. Eh, tell me, give me his CV. Adulterer? Chronic womanizer? Eh? Area boy or area man <laughs> or area father. <laughs> How many of you know Samson was not only all of that? He was also a killer. Eh? Not only a killer, a rapist. Not only a rapist, a tyrant. And at the end of his life, what did he do to himself? Committed suicide. How did you know that? 
Old Testament. What about Moses? Moses. Mose, Mose. What about Moses? Murderer. What again? Anger. What again? Stammerer. Liar. What else? Yes, he was hot tempered. Huh? Lawgiver. <laughs> huh? Law breaker. How did you know that? Old Testament. Okay, let's cross over. In the New Testament, who is Abraham? Father of faith. Who obtained good report? Kabayada. Who is David? A man of faith. A man after God's heart. Who obtained good report. What about Samson? Father of faith. Who by faith obtained good report. My goodness. What about, wait, wait. There's somebody I omitted. Because it's not only men. Let's, let's, let's check Rehab in the Old Testament. <laughs> Who was Rahab in the Old Testament? Prostitute. Harlot. Ashawo. What else? Eh? Eh? Ron's babe. <laughs> How do you know that? Okay, let's cross over in the New Testament. Who is Rahab? An elder of faith who obtained it looks like once you cross over to the new testament there's a way God looks at you that is different from the way the old testament looks at you. <laughs> no I, I, I will say that <laughs> yeah it looks like once you cross over from the old testament to the new testament Everybody's CV is upgraded. Not just upgraded, has a brand new CV. You know the one that even blesses me all the time is Moses took somebody, took somebody, killed him, dug the ground, buried him. And covered it. The next day two people were fighting and Moses came to separate the fight. And one of them said, you murderer, are you trying to kill me like the man that you killed yesterday and buried? Moses thought he did a clean job. He didn't know that there was leakage. So what did Moses do? He ran. He ran for his life. He ran for his life. When the New Testament was reporting the same account. He said, by faith, Moses. By faith, Moses. When he was come of age. Refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So what did he do? He forsook Egypt. Why did he forsake Egypt? Esteeming the reproach of Christ. Better riches than the treasures in Egypt. <laughs> glory! 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 That's what the New Testament makes available to us. Your sins and iniquities I will remember again no more. Somebody shout, I'm a New Testament believer. I'm born of God. I didn't hear powerful amen. Now, now, sit down, let's look at something. Do you know that the New Testament is not an afterthought? Number one, the New Testament is not an afterthought. Number two, the New Testament is not a reaction to the Old Testament. It's not an afterthought. It's not like God's plan was Old Testament. Then when Old Testament failed, God now say, oh, oh, now that Old Testament has failed us, let's bring New Testament. No, it was not an afterthought. The New Testament is not an afterthought. It's not something that God had to do as an emergency fix for the Old Testament. No, the New Testament was the plan. The Old Testament was an interruption of the New Testament. So watch this. The New Testament started from Genesis. The New Testament started from Genesis. 
Then the Old Testament interrupted the New Testament in Exodus. Then Jesus came, rusticated the Old Testament, and reinforced the New Testament, which was God's original plan. Because God does not react. How do we know that? Are you ready for this? Galatians chapter 3, verse number 16. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 16. Now to Abraham and his seed, where the promise is made, he saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Question, who is the seed of Abraham? Christ. All right, next verse. Please follow carefully now. If you miss it, you shouldn't have been in this class at all. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ. There was a covenant confirmed before. And that covenant was God's covenant expressed in Christ. The law which was 430 years after after what? After the covenant that was confirmed before in Christ. So, was it the covenant in Christ first or the law first? So, the covenant in Christ predated the law. So, the law came after the covenant in Christ. Okay? which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of non-effect. That means the covenant in Christ was a promise. That means that covenant in Christ that came before the law was a promise. The promise of God in Christ. Then the law came to interrupt. Pay attention. Watch the next verse. I love brother Paul Sunesis. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. So question. Who did God give it the inheritance to by promise? Abraham. What was before the law? The covenant of God where? In Christ. And that covenant was given as what? As a promise. Who was given the promise? Which personality was given the promise in the Old Testament? Abraham. So Abraham was not part of the law. So that means Abraham lived before the law. That means the law came after Abraham. That means Abraham never functioned under the law. That means Abraham functioned under the new covenant in Christ. So that is why Abraham Abraham by faith an elder. Good report. That's why Abraham could lie over his wife and still be blessed. Does God tolerate lies? No. But there was no law to tell Abraham that lying was wrong. So since there was no law, his lie was not a sin. Not a sin in the sense that it was not recorded. Look at Romans chapter 5 verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. So people were sinning, but they were not punished. Because there was no law. If I drive through this road every day to work, and there's no traffic light, I can drive at any speed level, because there's no traffic light. Okay? And nothing is wrong. 
But the moment you introduce a traffic light here, and I'm coming with speed as usual, and I see red and I go, what happens to me? I've broken the law. So what happens to me? I'm arrested. Okay? Because now there is a law. When there was no law, nothing was wrong. So it is the arrival of the law that defines sin and its consequences. Before the law came, people were sinning, but it was not recorded. There was no law to hold men accountable. So that's why Abraham operated before the law. And before the law, he was a righteous man. Moses was also a righteous man because Moses gave the law but didn't operate under the law. The law was not for Moses. The law was for them. You know, every time Moses spoke, he kept saying, you. The Egyptians, you see. Not we see. No, you. Me, I'm not with you people. You are under the law. I am under grace. So the Egyptians, you see today. You will see them no more. I don't know if I'm teaching here. Because Moses, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Moses did not operate under the law. Why? Because Moses had Christ. Moses had Christ. So he gave them the law because they didn't accept Christ. The law is not for believers. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. The law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers and men slayers. The law is not made for the righteous. The law is made for sinners. Why is the law made for sinners? Because sinners are those who reject Christ. Once you receive Christ, the law is not for you. Why? Christ fulfilled the law, so you are free from the law. So you stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free and don't be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. The Old Testament is what we call the law. So listen, Genesis is not Old Testament. Genesis is New Testament. Exodus to Malachi, by extension, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are Old Testament. Acts to Revelation, New Testament continuation from Genesis. Actually, the law started in Exodus 19. In the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. The movement of the people. That's where the law of Moses started. And that is why nobody under the law could be justified. It was the law that therefore necessitated the coming of Christ. Because Christ had to come and fulfill that law so that men can be justified by faith. Abraham by faith. Abel by faith. All of them by faith. Now, let me arrive at the destination of this teaching tonight. Are you blessed? Galatians chapter 3 again, verse number 18. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Next verse now, 19. Watch this. Wherefore then, served the law, it was added because of transgressions. The law was not God's plan. The law was added. The law was an addendum. It was not part of the plan. Why was the law added? Because of transgression. What is transgression? Rebellion against the word of God. It was added. It's not the plan. It was added because of transgression till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So the law was ordained by angels in the hands of Moses. So the law was an oppression of Moses and the angel. 
Moses and the angels fabricated the law and gave it to Israel and the angels that walked with Moses were the supernatural arm of Moses' ministry under the law. So that's why if you disobey the law, you are punished by those angels. And the punishment is supernatural. That's why the ground was opening and swallowing people. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 2. For if the word spoken by angels, where did the angels speak their words? The law. The law. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and under that oppression, every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. Next verse. How shall we escape if we neglect the salvation that Jesus has brought? So Jesus brought his salvation to free us from the law and the punishment of the law. What was the law of Moses? Tooth for tooth, eye for eye, leg for leg. Do me, I do you. Slap me, I slap you. You draw nigh, I draw nigh. You don't draw nigh, I don't draw nigh. That's the law of Moses. If you shall hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God and shall observe to do according to all that is written therein, that is when the blessing shall come. And if you disobey, curses will come. That's Moses in operation. That's Moses. So, churches where there is blessing and curse in the church is Moses' church. Because that's the way Moses operates. Under Moses is blessing and curse. You touch me by mistake. You die by fire. That is Moses in operation. My father, my father. Anyone looking for my trouble? Be roasted. That is Moses in operation. Because under Moses' ministry, every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. You can't go free. Any Moses does not forgive and the angels that work with him. Are we teaching good? That's Moses. A pastor who stands before his church and says, if you try me, I will curse you. Is wearing the regalia of who? Moses. It's Moses. That's not Christ. That's not Jesus' ministry. That is Moses' ministry. Kabayada. I'm getting blessed, I'm telling you. John chapter 5, verse 45. Do not think that I, Jesus, this is Jesus talking, I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. Who is the accuser of the brethren? Moses. Even Moses, in whom you trust. He's the one that accuses you. He's the one that condemns you. He's the one that makes you guilty. Moses. Whom you trust. Jesus is talking. Now look at the way Jesus will end that discourse. Next verse. For. <laughs> Pastor Kuhn, look at this one. you like it. For had you believed Moses. You would have believed me. For he wrote of me. Uh uh. So Moses wrote two things. Moses has two messages. Moses preached Christ and preached accusation. Are we clear? So that's why the book of Moses must be rightly divided because there are two messages inside. 
One section of Moses' books is death. The other section is life. I said before you, life and death. You choose. That's Moses. And a preacher is not permitted to mix the two. Don't mix the two. Don't be blessing and cursing. My brother, can sweet and bitter water come out of the same fountain? You can't be cursing and blessing. You're either a blesser or a cursor. Light and darkness cannot operate in the same house. Moses preached Christ and accusation. Moses himself said, if now that I am with you people, you are behaving like this, how much more when I go? He said, you are a forward children in whom there is no faith. So because you don't have faith, take law. Moses wrote the law. It was not God that wrote the law. The law of Moses is not God. The law of Moses is Moses' property. John 1 17. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Question What does Jesus bring? Grace and truth. What does Moses bring? Law. What follows the law? Sin and death. Condemnation. Guilt. Accusation. What does Jesus bring? Grace, which is truth. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 28. Because of time. Follow the reading. I'll read, then I will explain. Let's start from 27. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say, who is saying now? Jesus, okay? Who are those that said of old time? Good. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Next verse. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast. Who said this? Eh? Who is Jesus quoting? Moses. Wait, 31. What Jesus was saying is, if you people are really following the law of Moses, there should be people with amputated hands among you and people without eyes among you. So since all of you have your hands intact and eyes intact, if you preach law, you are a hypocrite. Any of you preaching law and nobody in your congregation's hand or leg has been removed, and they have their eye intact. You yourself, the preacher, you are a hypocritical preacher. Because if you are really following the law, there should be people already whose hands you have chopped off and whose eyes you have plucked. That means Muslims are more faithful than you. Because in Islam, if you steal and you are caught, they take out your hand and they don't play with it. Because they, they remove Moses' law and made it part of Islamic religion. And they follow the law well. But you, you are a pastor preaching law and everybody have their eye intact. <laughs> Meanwhile, in your church, brothers are busy looking at women and looking at women and you have never caught one to remove his eye. And you say you are a preacher defending the law. You are de in defense of the gospel. You are defending Moses. And everybody in your church, their eyes are intact and their hands are intact, including you yourself. All of you are hypocrites. Which gospel are you defending? The law of Moses. I mean, that's what Jesus was communicating. Are, are you not seeing it? 
Is it not in your Bible? I mean, it's clear. Jesus is indicting the Pharisees and the law keepers. He says, it has been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Who said it? Moses. Next verse. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committed adultery. And many people have been locked up in prison from this verse. Because they say, Jesus say, you cannot divorce your wife except adultery. It's not Jesus. Jesus is quoting Moses. It's Moses that said it. Jesus is only trying to show them the limitation of that law. Next verse. Again, you have heard that it had been said by them of old time. Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oath. Next verse. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shall thou swear by thy head, because thou cannot make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than this, cometh of evil. You have heard that it had been said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Who said that? Next verse. But I say unto you that you resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that accept thee. And from he that will borrow of thee, turn not thou away. You have heard it had been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Who said that? Next verse. But I, Jesus, say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? That you may be the children of your father which is in heaven. For his maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. What did Jesus do here? He took the law of Moses, retired it, and showed you the way your father operates. That means the law of Moses does not reflect the character of God. The law of Moses does not reflect the character of God. The character of God is only reflected in Christ. Forgive those that hurt you. Bless those that use you anyhow. Somebody does you wrong, don't curse him. Speak a blessing over him. That's the way your father operates. Your father makes the sun to shine on evil people and good people. Your father makes the rain to fall on people that are good and people that are bad. That's the way your father operates. The law condemns. The law destroys. Jesus justifies. Are you still here? They brought a woman that was caught in the act of adultery to Jesus. Say so we caught her in the very act. And you know, um, I'm sure they must have brought her half naked. Because if they caught her in the act, they can't catch her in the act dressed. You will bring her as evidence now. Yes, and remember, it is core evidence you are bringing because you are asking for kill her. You can't say kill her based on rumor. There must be core evidence. So they must have carried her the way they found her. Red-handed. And if possible, self, help her to remove the wrapper. So they can bring her well. But you know the question I keep asking. One woman does not commit adultery. And if you caught her in the act, that means she and the man were together. Where is the man? There is no justice in the law. The law is lopsided. The law does what we call selective morality. Selective morality. 
You know what selective morality is? People that are under the law, the area where they have strength, they announce and amplify it. The area where they are weak, they hide it. When nobody is there, they do their own. Then when they come out to the public, they display the other side. They are careful sinners. <laughs> people, that are, people that practice the law are careful sinners. They commit sin carefully. <laughs> because, I mean, can you imagine? You caught these people in the act and you only brought the woman. Only the woman. And you know the law is anti-woman. I hope you know. It's loopsided. Because even in the issue of adultery, he said, if a man catches a woman in adultery, let him put her away. But said nothing about a man in adultery. It's only the woman that is put away by the law. The man is never put away. If they catch the man, they forgive him. But if they catch the woman, she must go. The law is lopsided. That's why it can't be God. The law of Moses does not represent God. It was what Moses thought he would use to tame these people who rejected the word of God. And many people are preaching the law of Moses to believers today. Which is injustice. Then they say to Jesus, Moses in the law says, stone her. Grace. 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 Yeah, yeah. All these preachers of grace, all these Dr. Damina, them and co, they are giving people license to sin. Yeah? License. All these grace preachers are just helping people to sin. Where did you hear that? We are seeing abounds. Grace much more abounds. The cure for sin is grace. God has no other solution for sin other than the grace of God. How can grace that cures sin be the license for sin? The grace of God that has appeared unto all men to bring men to salvation. The grace of God is God's cure. Grace, what do you say? What, what, you know what Jesus answered. Any of you that is without sin, cast a first stone. You, all of you here, if you have never done anything bad, throw the first stone. Then they started meditating. One by one, they started remembering their little, little things that are hiding. And they were dropping the stone and leaving. After the last person left, Jesus lifted his head. Woman, where are the accusers? Do not think that I will accuse you. <laughs> where is the accusers? Had no man condemned thee? Yea, Lord, no man has condemned me. He didn't say prostitute. He didn't say fornicator. He didn't say adulterer. He says woman. No matter where you are, God never takes away your dignity. No matter how wrong you get, God never deshines you. He never disgraces you. Because he does not condemn. He said, I am not come to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. Woman! Where are the accusers? Had no man condemned thee? Yea, Lord. Neither do I condemn you. Even though there is evidence, I do not condemn you. God never condemns. Anytime you are condemned, Satan is at work. God never condemns. Neither do I condemn you. And he didn't tell her, confess it. He didn't talk, close your eyes and confess. Tell me exactly how it happened. How did it start? Come on. And then what happened? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What happened next? Then what happened? Uh -huh. So what, what were two of you doing when they found you? Explain. <laughs> explain, explain. I'm waiting. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Then what happened? Uh -huh. You're almost there. Don't stop halfway. I know the whole truth. Finish it. God doesn't behave like that. God does not want you to be uncomfortable. He wants you to come boldly to your throne of grace. He wants you to approach him with confidence. He's a loving father. He loves you the way you are. Stop trying to pretend. Be yourself. So that if there is a problem, he has the solution to your problem. 
God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their sins unto them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. That's the gospel to preach it on the mountain top. Preach it on the valley. Preach it in the house. Preach it on the streets. Preach it on television. Preach it on radio. Preach it on the internet. Somebody shout, I have something to preach. It is the gospel of Christ. I didn't hear you shout that amen like thunder. Stand on your feet. That's all I've got for you. Neither do I condemn you. Go. And sin no more. Uh, and then, you know, Pastor Ko, the legalist will say, but, but, but yes, even though Jesus did not condemn her, Jesus still told her, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. <laughs> it's true that Jesus did not condemn her, but don't leave the other side. Which side? Go and sin no more. <laughs> go and sin no more. They like that side. Go and sin no more. Uh, that's not how it ended. After he told her, go and sin no more, he now told her, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me. That means the solution to sin is to follow me. Shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of light. So if you're not going to sin again, then follow me. It didn't stop at go and sin no more. The only way not to sin no more is to follow me. I am the light of the world. That's what we call the gospel. It is the gospel of the forgiveness of sins. Praise God. Lift your right hands, Father. We pray. Thank you for every man, every woman of God, every pastor, every minister of the gospel here. Under the sound of my voice, I ask that each one hearing the sound of my voice leaves this place on fire. To preach this gospel like never before. In the name of Jesus. Kabayon tongaladabaha. Zebra gado shakayana. Mengro da sokala da baba. Le groto sokala da bambre gado zakila namaha. Mengo lo do bojekele de babra. Rapota le badaga. Wherever you're hearing the sound of my voice. Online, around the nations of the world. In the building here. Receive boldness to preach the gospel. Receive boldness to preach the gospel. Receive utterance. Receive utterance. In the name of Jesus platforms open up for you to preach receive platforms opening up for you all over the nations of the world in the name of jesus i rebuke the voice of condemnation i review the voice of fear i rebuke the voice of inferiority complex lose your hearts in the name of jesus Cabo Dagaya. Cabo Dagaya. Listen, everybody, there, there, there's, there are about two ministers here I want to pray for. The devil has been using certain things, and I don't want to get specific, but I know exactly what I saw. The devil has been using certain things to drum into your mind to make you incapable of ministry. Every time you want to rise and move in, the devil will bring those thoughts. And it weakens you. Even when you are trying not to be weakened. It still weakens you. I want to pray for you right now. Because you can't function like this in the new year. You can't. Wherever you are. I need you to come quickly. I want to pray for you. Right now. Right now. Right here. He keeps bringing those things to your mind. He keeps making you incapable. Incompetent. Every time. He keeps bringing those things. Every time you want to take a step. And obey and do the ministry and preach the gospel. The devil will remind you those things and use them. And those things weaken your resolve. They make you incapable of answering and fulfilling God's purpose for your life. I like you, church, to stretch your hands towards them. It's a serious issue we're dealing with here. balata. Membro dazaka. Pray for one another that you may be healed. I'd like you to stretch your hands towards them from all over the building. Let's pray for them. Let's pray for them. Let's pray for them. For healing. Right now, all those thoughts, cast them down. Imaginations, bring them down. Bring them down. Everything that has been making noise in their minds, the thoughts, the holes of the enemy, the voice of fear, the voice of the enemy that keeps drawing them back and holding them back. Let's pray together as a collective force. 
Pray for one another that you may be healed. Barriers terminated. Guilt and condemnation. The voice of intimidation. The voice of inabilities. The voice of human frailties. Command those voices to shut up. Legosomia. Legosomia, 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 Angaredebo Sakayata, Babere Ketena, Babere Ketena, Babere Ketena, Babere Ketena, Babere Ketena, Babere Ketena, Babere Ketena. Pray for them, pray for them. Barriers terminated, limitations removed. Those clogs on their legs taken off. Rako sepina gada. Lengro to sekelere baya. Baya, 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 baya. Lako sobere ketana. Legro shotola. Legro shotola. Legro shotela. Every voice of the enemy. Loose, loose, loose. Loose them. Let them fulfill that assignment. Lego Subrinanta Lambo Sekelaya Lambo Sekelaya Matomba la tatata Matomba la tatata Matomba la tatata Matomba la tatata Thank you Lord And I declare as I place my hands on you Right now Whatever the enemy has used to hold you back, terminate it, terminate it, terminate it. And I declare a new, a new unction, a new ability, a new ability to clothe you like a garment. I command you release, release to run with the plan, to run with the purpose, to run with the assignment, to run with all that God has put on your inside. In the name of Jesus. Lego sobia nakata, Lego sobia namakata, la grotto shekele de baba. Now, kebato, 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 enga, mato, mela, kura, dega, 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 anga, nego, seba, lego rakotobelata. Membra to sukaladaba. I silence the enemy's voice. Legro to saka, Legro to suka, angato bega. And God to beggar, I release you now. I release you. Go forth in the name of Jesus. Fulfill the call. Fulfill the purpose. Fulfill your assignment. Take it. Makato, 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 makato. Le grato sakaba. 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 Agaya, agaya. Agaya, agaya. Agaya, agaya. Agaya, agaya. Hey. Sotaladaba, Sotalada, Sotalada, Mambrato Sekea, Mambrato Sekea, Mambrato Sekea, Agaba Sotalada, Agaba Sotalaga, Angre de Sekea, Angre de Sekea, Angre de Sekea, Angre de Sekea, Jotola Batoba, Botoba, 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 Agaya, 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 Agaya. Hey, Matola Dagaya. Receive, receive, receive. Yes, yes. Kodado do 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 lu da 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 dos. Naya no sondanga la dagagash. Hey, egebaso. From your head to your legs. A kamano sakaya. A stop the deposit of God on your inside. Retomba la tabato nangaga. Receive, receive and go forth in the name of Jesus. Barriers taken off. Megato, 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 megato. Lengo sopata, sopota, sapato, sopata, makato, megelea. Nengro to saka baraka to nagagas. Ayatoba. Take it. Take it. Whom the sun frees is free. Every hold is broken. Take it. Moshata la tabas. Govov. Mashonto lakata. Mosata. In the name of Jesus, you're released. Thank you, Lord. Grace. 
in the name of Jesus. Zapatoko Lydia, receive in the name of Jesus. Praise you, Father. Matola Gasatana. Matola Gasatana. Zekroto Sakayada. Mangrodo Sukala da Babaloto Pikatananga. Hanga Soparakata. Zese, 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 Zese. Nango Sutalayadas. Agayananko Soparakata. Sokarata pa. Sokarata pa. Sokarata pa. Ho, ho, ho. Zibo do Godon Glada Gaba. Tayas. 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 In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lift your hands and just wave them to the Lord wherever you are. Listen to me carefully. In the years to come and in the days to come and in the weeks to come, in the months to come, in the hours to come, saith God, the alignment for the preaching of the truth will get sharper than ever before. It will get sharper, saith God. It will not be like it used to be where the light and the darkness looked like they were mixed. It will be so sharp, you will know those that are sincerely in the ministry and those who are clowns in the ministry. Saith God, the message will come out with clarity. Men and women who have spent hours, saith God, of consecration, hours of prayer, hours of dedication, and hours of preparation, I have granted them an understanding of my word like never before, and they are going to proclaim it without fear or favor, and my word is going to rise big among you and among the people, in a way where it will be so obvious and so clear the distinction. The distinction between truth and falsehood. The distinction between light and darkness. And the distinction will be very sharp. Saith God, you give yourself wholly, wholeheartedly, and totally to my cause. And I will rise big on your inside and through you manifest my glory and my grace like never before. Amen. And as you yield, as you yield to me, I will show you things you've never known. And I will give you all the preparation and equipping that you require to manifest my glory like never before. Amen. Say of God, there will be more and more demands made on you for ministry. <laughs> hours of study, hours of prayer, hours of consecration, sacrifices upon sacrifices in preparing you for the days and the years. And the weeks of the preaching of the truth of the gospel. And as you consecrate yourself to me and present yourself to me. I will cause you to navigate through my world with such light. Such light. That you will speak my word and darkness cannot be able to stand it. So saith God. My spirit steers you up within. My spirit stimulates you. And my spirit motivates you. To isolate yourself from time to time. And be lost in the study and prayer. To consecrate yourself for the great things I will do. Because mighty things and great things that men have not seen. Will be unfolded in the days and weeks to come. And my glory will cover the earth as the water covers the sea, saith God. 
Men will come from every walk of life to hear and to learn. To hear and to learn. Saith God, the hunger for my word will increase like never before. The appetite for the truth of my word will increase like never before. And men are going to run away from falsehood. Men are going to run away from lying lips. Men are going to run away from another gospel. Men are going to run away from deception. And there will be a hunger stirred up. For the truth of my word. And saith God. All those who set themselves apart. And consecrate themselves by my word. To preach the truth of the gospel. There will be days ahead. Where so much glory and grace will be seen upon you. And will be made manifest upon you that the hours of study and hours of consecration and hours of dedication and faithfulness will be nothing compared to the glory that will be seen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Father. Wave those hands and give him praise and give him glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Give him praise and give him glory and give him praise and give him glory. I give him praise. I give him praise. Thank you, Lord. 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 Is a higher calling, saith God. Is a higher calling. Is a higher calling. It's a call that is higher than anything else. A call to bring forth my grace and bring forth my glory and reveal my glory and power to a world that is in dire need of knowing me. Is a higher call. And that is why the sacrifices are high. But my grace is greater than the price. My grace is greater than the price. All you are required to do is to be willing. And if you are willing, my spirit will enable you to navigate through paths that looked impossible. To navigate through ways that looked impossible to mortal men. Yeah, it shall not be by your might. It shall not be by your power. It shall not be by your strength. It shall be by my spirit. But you will have to yield to my spirit. And my spirit will take you through paths you have never been through. My spirit will take you through ways you have never walked in before. And yea, it will be such glory and grace manifesting upon people who will come close to you to partake of what I have revealed through you. And the world will rejoice. And the world will be glad. And the world will celebrate what I have made available through you, saith God. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. It's a higher call. It's a higher sacrifice. It's a higher prize. But my grace is greater than the prize. And if you will yield, you will see my glory like you've never seen it before. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Just wave those hands and give him praise and give him thanks. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The work is done. Yeah, the work will not be done. The work is done. You didn't hear me. The work of God will not be done. The work of God is done. Yeah, it's done. It's done. I say the work is done. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I say the work is done. I say the work is done. Ah, I say the work is done. Glory! Glory! Woo! Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Oh my goodness, what a service, what a word. I know you have been blessed. And I want to encourage you to stay with me every day. I'm live on this platform, 12 noon GMT plus one and 6 p.m. GMT plus one. God's word keeps coming with clarity so that you are built up, equipped, and edified. And help me invite more people to this platform so we can enrich the people of God, empower them to fulfill the purpose of God for their lives. I wrote a book, it's titled, Every Man a Minister. And I want to encourage you to order for a copy of this book and the many other books I have written. This book is a must have. You can't wait one more minute without ordering for this book. It will enrich you and help you serve the purpose of God to your generation. I'm very excited about the opportunity to serve you the grace of God every time. Let me also mention that you must not forget, you must not forget that 
in case in your community there's no Christ-centered church where what you hear me teach is being taught, we would like to either direct you to one in your area or work with you, train you, and help you start one so that other believers in your area can come there, learn Christ, and grow in his knowledge. If you're interested in either joining a campus or beginning one in your area, don't forget to shoot a mail today. I'll be waiting to hear from you. We love you. We're excited. My prayer for you is that you abound in grace, you abound in knowledge, you grow into the fullness of God's purpose for your life. It is well with you. You are strengthened with might by the Spirit in the inner man. Christ dwells in your heart by faith. You are rooted and grounded in love. Great grace is upon you today. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen to your victory.